Range of motion. Simply put, it's the degree of movement at a joint. We're training with a full range of motion, means you go through the full movement potential for an exercise, and when you train with a partial range of motion, you purposefully cut the movement short in some way. And from what I've seen, most people tend to fall neatly into one of two camps. I would guess that at least half my audience falls in the so-called science camp, where it's thought that a full range of motion is better for muscle growth, and for the most part, partial reps are really ego reps. But I'd say that some of you find yourselves agreeing more with what I'm gonna call the bro side, where you'd rather use partial reps either because they allow you to move more weight or because they allow you to keep constant tension on the muscle by keeping the weight in the so-called mid-range. You might also point out that many IFBB pro bodybuilders use partials and they've got better gains than all of us. So the anecdotal support seems to be on the side of partial reps as well. And up front, I will say that I think both sides have some good points, but which side has it more right? Well, let's start with the three arguments coming from the bro side. Their first argument is that partials allow you to move more weight, meaning more tension on the muscle. And while it is true that you will be able to load more weight when you cut the range of motion short, that actually doesn't mean you're putting more tension on the muscle. And that's because the extra weight is coming at a cost. As you increase the weight, you're simultaneously decreasing the distance that weight is moving. For example, let's say you currently squat 225 pounds or two plates per side for three sets of eight reps. If you decide to cut the range of motion in half, so now you can all of a sudden squat three plates per side, on the surface, it might look like you're handling more total workload, but you're actually handling significantly less. Doing 225 for three sets of eight reps would net 5,400 pounds of volume. But when we calculate workload, distance is assumed to be constant. So if we decide to jack the weight up to 315 pounds by cutting the range of motion in half, we also cut our workload in half. So that increase in weight simply isn't worth the trade-off in distance from a hypertrophic standpoint. So the bro's first argument isn't the best, and trading range of motion for weight is almost always a bad trade, but there may be a few legitimate exceptions that we'll get to. Okay, the second argument from the bro side is much better in my opinion, and it's that partials allow you to maintain constant tension on the muscle by staying in what you could call the active mid-range of the movement. And this argument is different from the first because rather than just cutting the range in half, the constant tension advocates tend to stop just shy of full lockout by cutting out the top and bottom of each rep. Their idea here is that if you fully lock out a rep, your muscle gets a little mini rest and briefly loses tension in between reps which may not be ideal for growth. And in fact, one 2017 study supports that hypothesis. Researchers compared doing skull crushers through a full range of motion to doing skull crushers through a half range of motion restricted to the middle part of the lift. So the full range group would be getting a little tension break at the top of each rep, whereas the partial group would have the triceps engaged from start to finish throughout the set. And after eight weeks of controlled training, they found significantly better muscle growth in the partial group and by quite a lot, just about twice the gains by keeping constant tension. And these were decently well-trained subjects too. And while this study did have its limitations, for example, the partial group may have just been getting closer to failure, I still think it lends some support to the bro's argument for constant tension, at least on certain movements. So on exercises like skull crushers and dumbbell flies, where the top part of the range is really easy, I think it does make sense to stop slightly shy of full lockout. However, in my opinion, this advantage is most likely limited to free weight isolation exercises and probably wouldn't apply as well to exercises that use cables and machines because they automatically automatically provide constant tension for the most part, so here it makes more sense to emphasize a full stretch and full squeeze instead. And before we get too excited about this single study, I should point out that of the six studies we currently have on range of motion and hypertrophy, this is in fact the only one that favored using a partial range of motion. Again, likely because a single joint free weight isolation exercise like the skull crusher is uniquely benefited by constant tension when compared to other exercises. And we'll come back to the other studies here in a minute. First, let's address the final argument from the bro side, which is that most IFBB pro bodybuilders use partials. Now, first of all, I'm not entirely sure that's true. At least in the classic era, it was very common to see top pros using a full range of motion on a variety of different exercises. And here you can see Arnold and Ed Corney doing some deep squats with a full lockout at the top. But I know a lot of modern day pros do seem to favor partials, so let's just assume it is true that most IFBB pros today like to do partials over a full range of motion. Still, the problem is that these bodybuilding anecdotes simply lack the rigor and control of scientific studies. In other words, it's really hard to say if these bodybuilders are getting their results from partials specifically, or from some other training variable, or from great genetics, or because of their nutrition, or supplementation. Now, I don't think these anecdotes are worthless. I'm actually open to the idea that partials are better for this population, but I also think that when making recommendations, if there's stronger, better evidence available, which there is in this case, these anecdotes should be taken with something of a grain of salt. 
So let's take a closer look at what the science really has to say about range of motion and muscle growth. Like I mentioned earlier this year, a systematic review was published examining all six studies that we currently have looking at range of motion and muscle growth. Now I won't have time to go through all six in detail, but the bottom line is that all four lower body studies found that a full range of motion was better and the upper body studies gave conflicting results. One of the upper body studies found no difference between doing full range curls and active tension curls, and the other was the skull crusher study we just discussed. Again, the only one out of the six to actually favor partials. So taken together, I think we have good enough evidence to say that a full range of motion is usually better for muscle growth and especially for the legs. I mean, just consider this one study from Bloomquist and colleagues. They compared heavier partial squats to lighter deep squats and despite being lighter, the deep squats still caused much more muscle growth at every site across the entire quadricep. And taking all of this evidence together, I think the best rule of thumb is to use a full range of motion most of the time by getting a reasonably full stretch at the bottom and a reasonably full contraction at the top. But this doesn't need to be taken to the extreme either, and there's no benefit to pushing your range of motion beyond your comfortable limits. For example, some people's skeleton simply won't let them squat ultra deep without tons of lower backgrounding. So when deciding what full range of motion means, it is important to keep your own mobility in mind and avoid the more is always better trap. In fact, a recent mass piece pointed out that as long as you actually get to the hardest part of a lift, you're probably maximizing the hypertrophic effects. And since squats tend to be hardest at around parallel, squatting to just below parallel is probably nearly as good or just as good as squatting ass to grass for quad growth. But there are also a few exceptions to the full range rule. First, I think it does make sense to use partials as an advanced technique on some isolation exercises where you simply cut the bottom or top part of the range out where it starts to feel really easy. For example, I'll often cut out the bottom of dumbbell lateral raises because there's no tension on the delt down there, and I usually don't fully lock out skull crushers or dumbbell flies for the same reason. I also think it's smart for more advanced trainees to do some extended sets on isolation exercises for stubborn body parts where you extend the set beyond failure by doing partials after exhausting your ability to do a full range of motion, especially if it's your last set for that muscle. Of course, this shouldn't make up the majority of your program, but it can have its place as an exception to the full range of motion rule. Second, the bench press and deadlift may also be an exception for some power lifters or power builders, since the goal isn't to merely maximize muscle growth, but also to move maximum weight within the guidelines of the sport. So I personally use a powerlifting style arch on my bench press, despite the fact that this will limit my range of motion to some extent. However, when you compare the joint angles between an arched bench and a flat bench, there's actually not that much range of motion difference anyway. So this is a fair trade-off for me, especially once you consider that the bench press isn't the only exercise I do for my chest. So I can make up any minor range of motion deficit by simply combining exercises. I also make a similar exception for the deadlift, where it's a smarter powerlifting strategy for me to use a sumo stance, even if it limits range of motion slightly. And again, because I still hit the hardest part of the lift, the hypertrophic implications are likely negligible, especially once you consider that I'll be combining different exercises for these muscles again. So perhaps unsurprisingly, I do find myself more on the science side of this debate. I think that as a general rule of thumb, training with a full range of motion all the time will get you better results than training through a partial range of motion all the time. But luckily, in the real world, our advice doesn't have to be quite that black and white, and I think we'll get our best results when we borrow the best of the wisdom both sides have to offer. All right, what is going on guys? Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I wanted to give you guys a quick update before I close out the video here. First and most importantly, look who's back. I made it. I'm here. So she's been back in Canada for just over two weeks now, and it's been great having her here. She just finished up her quarantine, so we've been able to go outside and enjoy some of the Canadian snow and the scenery, and we're enjoying our new home here in Ontario. Um, also, it is a new year, so happy new year to all of you guys. Um, I hope that you guys had a great Christmas and a great new year, and I did want to update you on a couple things that you may find resourceful um, if you're trying to take your, your fitness or your bodybuilding goals to the next level in 2021. First things first, I do have a free program available on my website. It's a two to four week bridge program that's designed to help people who've taken a break from training get back to regular lifting. If after that you want to run one of my programs, they're all 20 to 30% off up until January 14th. So for the first two weeks of New Year's, you can save 20 to 30% off all my programs. I also want to mention my ultimate guide to body recomposition here. I know some people ended up losing some muscle in 2020, which is understandable given the circumstances. The good news is if you did lose muscle, you're primed and in the perfect position to build muscle and lose fat at the same time, which isn't always easy, but if you did lose muscle, 
The muscle memory effect will make it quite easy for you. Um, so this book details absolutely everything you need to know about body recomposition, and I'll leave that as a link in the description box down below as well. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave it a thumbs up. I hope you guys have a very good year ahead, and I will see you all here in a video very soon.